So that intro may have left you with some questions. But I assure you that I will answer them in this video. Starting with, what was that big word that just appeared on the screen? Paleoclimatology is the study of what the climate of our Earth was like in the past. More specifically, it helps us find out what our Earth's climate was like before we started keeping the meticulous, direct climate records, which give us a very accurate view of what our climate is like today. So now that you know what paleoclimatology is, you may be wondering, how does it work? Paleoclimatologists use what are called proxy records to gain quantitative data on various measures relevant to climate, including temperature, rainfall, and the concentration of certain gases. Proxy records are natural archives which store climate information through a variety of methods, which differentiates them from direct records as those are made by us humans. Proxy record, direct record. Proxy record, direct record. Proxy record, direct record. While paintings are human-made, they do not directly provide us with quantitative climate data and are therefore indirect proxy records. Direct records must be human-made and directly provide us with quantitative data with no interpretation required. Each proxy record is different, with different information stored, different methods of storing this information, different degrees of accuracy, and various start times. But when these records are compared with direct records and each other, and if the sample size is large enough, they can give us a fairly accurate picture of what our climate was like at different points in the past. As trees grow, they go through two growth cycles per year. During the spring and early summer, the tree does most of its growing due to the wetter conditions of this time of year. During this cycle, the tree grows large cells with thin cell walls producing a lighter colored wood known as the early wood. In the late summer and the fall, the tree begins to produce wood at a slower rate and the cells produced are smaller and have thicker cell walls creating darker colored wood known as the late wood. The cycle repeats itself every year and the thickness of both the light and the dark rings indicate how favorable the climactic conditions of that year were to that tree's growth. The thicker the rings, the more favorable growing conditions were that year. The growth process is an integral part of dendrochromology. Dendrochronology, or tree dating, is the science of determining what our climate was like in the past using the annual growth rings on trees, based on the principles mentioned earlier. Dendrochronology, like all other good science, is conducted in accordance with the scientific method. Dendrochromologists start off by asking a question similar to, what was the climate of, insert area here, like in the past? They then form a hypothesis based on both direct records and indirect proxy records for that area. After that, they conduct their experiment and take samples from a large number of trees in an area. Dendrochromologists take two types of samples, cross sections and increment cores. Cross sections are better than increment cores as they provide a full view of all the rings, allowing any irregularities to be taken into account. But cross sections can only be taken from dead trees as taking a cross section from a live tree would most certainly kill it. And due to the large sample size needed to ensure accurate results, a large chunk of the forest would be leveled by the end of the experiment. To avoid this problem and the wrath of hippies everywhere, dendrochromologists use increment borers to drill long, narrow increment cores out of the trees. This does not kill the tree as it only takes away a small amount of wood. To avoid any irregularities being misinterpreted as tree rings, dendrochromologists often take multiple cores from a single tree at various heights to ensure the most accurate results possible. Side note, when you're taking increment cores, it is essential that you include the pith or center of the tree in your increment core, or else you will be unable to date the sample. In this case, cores A and C are useless. After dendrochromologists take a large number of samples from an area, the samples are observed under a microscope. Dendrochromologists count the tree rings and determine how old the tree was when it began growing, so they can associate each of the growth rings with a year. For cores taken from living samples, this is done by marking the last complete growth ring and associating it with the year before the sample was taken. The rings are then counted from outermost to innermost, determining which year each ring was from. For cross sections taken from dead samples, they must first be cross dated with living samples from the same area and preferably of the same species, to determine which year the outermost complete growth ring is from. After this has been done, 
Each growth ring is associated with a year, using the same method as the living cores. After the rings have been dated, the preferred growing conditions of the species of tree the sample came from are taken into account so scientists can compare the characteristics of the tree rings to certain climactic conditions. For example, the California redwood, a favorite of dendrochromologists due to its long lifespan and resistance to rotting, prefers oceanic climates with high amounts of humidity, fog, and therefore moisture, and relatively low temperature variation. The years with the widest rings can be associated with the years where these conditions were most prevalent. After all the rings have been interpreted, samples are compared with each other, previously taken samples, other proxy records, and direct records for the area. Based on this data, dendrochromologists then come to a conclusion as to what the climate was like in the past for a certain area. There are a couple of problems with using trees as a proxy record. The first problem is that trees can only live so long, so the records only date back to the birth date of the oldest sample we can find. This can still carry us a long way into the past, with trees like the eastern white cedar found on the Niagara Escarpment of Ontario dating back up to 2,767 years, and the Hohenheim Oak found in Germany has given us climate records dating back 12,500 years. Furthermore, dead tree samples that have been preserved in ice or other mediums can be cross-examined with living samples, giving us records that date back even further. The second problem is that trees do not grow everywhere. Areas like deserts, the Arctic, and our oceans do not have trees growing in them. So how do we get climate records from these areas? When it comes to paleoclimatology, coral reefs are the forests of the ocean. Much like trees, coral produce growth rings which vary based on oceanic conditions like ocean surface temperature, nutrient availability, and water clarity. But this is where the similarities between trees and coral end. Rather than using wood, coral produce their growth rings out of calcium carbonate. This gives the coral the ability to keep a record of the chemical composition of the water around it in its calcium carbonate layers. This is a big deal as this data can tell us a lot about various oceanic and therefore climactic conditions for every year that the coral has been growing. Firstly, climatologists can measure the ratio of light and heavy oxygen for each growth band with more light oxygen indicating higher ocean temperatures and more rainfall. Secondly, measuring the ratio between calcium and strontium can indicate ocean temperature with a higher concentration of calcium indicating a higher ocean temperature for that year. Comparing these two ratios and the width of the growth rings across multiple samples can give us a clear picture of what the climate was like in the area of the ocean where the sample was taken. But this leads us to a problem. Coral reefs only grow in tropical regions of the ocean, so how do we find out what the past climate was like in other parts of the world? The rock and soil that you walk on every day contains volumes of evidence of our past climate, and the same goes for the sediment beneath the ocean floor. At any given time, new layers of soil and sediment are being deposited on the land and the ocean floor at a very, very slow rate. Over millions of years, due to heat from the center of the earth and pressure from layers above, these layers turn into rock and any organisms that become trapped in the soil and sediment turn into fossils. Scientists excavate the soil and rock and take sediment cores from various areas of the land and the ocean respectively. The samples are then dated using methods like radiometric age dating, though generally, the deeper the fossil or rock, the older it is. The samples are then observed, sometimes under a microscope. Paleontologists observe what types of fossils are found where and when, and palynologists do the same for pollen fossils. This can help determine what organisms, and in the case of pollen plants, lived where at what times, and by comparing that with what we already know about what types of climates these organisms preferred, we can gain a broad idea of what the climate must have been like at that time. But this is not the only thing rocks can tell us about our past climate. The rocks and caves can also be an indicator of the climatic conditions of an area. Stalactites and stalagmites found on the roof and floor of caves respectively form as water deposits minerals onto these rock formations. These formations grow faster during times of wet, rainy weather as more minerals get deposited onto them by an increased amount of water. 
These rocks can then be dated using radiometric age dating to determine which years experienced more growth and through that, how wet these years were. But this is not the only climate record that water helps us keep. As ice forms, air bubbles are trapped inside. These air bubbles contain the concentration of gases that were present in the Earth's atmosphere at the exact moment at which they were trapped. In areas like Antarctica and Greenland, where some of the ice hasn't unfrozen for millennia, this provides a record of the concentration of different gases in our atmosphere dating back 123,000 years in Greenland and over 800,000 years in Antarctica. Scientists can observe this record by taking and analyzing ice cores from these areas, once again using the basic principle, the further you go down, the older it is. These samples can be more accurately dated using various events like major volcanic eruptions as indicators. During these events, concentrations of certain gases like sulfur dioxide are known to have been significantly higher, and observing that in a layer of ice can tell you when that layer was formed and when the areas around it were formed. The ice cores are sliced into thin slices like meat is at a deli, and these slices are tested for various gases. Oxygen is one of the gases tested for, as the ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms indicates what temperature the air was when the air bubble was trapped. The more light oxygen there is, the cooler it was. As an added bonus, this ratio can be used to more accurately date the sample, as annual fluctuations in temperature change this ratio, so every year there will be a high point and a low point in the level of light oxygen. The samples are also tested for various greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, as higher levels of these gases indicate higher temperatures. Wrong. We do not know that these gases are linked to higher temperatures. Uh, yes we do. By comparing the temperatures indicated by the ratio of light to heavy oxygen atoms to the levels of these greenhouse gases found in the same air bubbles, and by comparing the data from the ice cores to data from other proxy records and direct records, climatologists have concluded that there is a correlation between higher temperatures and higher levels of these greenhouse gases, and therefore, higher levels of greenhouse gases cause a worldwide increase in the Earth's temperature. This is why proxy records are so important when it comes to proving climate change is real. We only started recording climate records very, very recently in both geologic and human history. CO2 levels were not consistently recorded until the 1950s. Proxy records provide a natural archive of this information dating back millennia, giving us mounds of data which makes it a lot easier to prove important correlations like the one between e increased carbon dioxide levels and higher temperatures. Furthermore, these proxy records paint a clear picture of what our climate was like at various points in the past. This allows us to compare past climates to ours of today and gives climatologists perspective as to how warm or cold our climate is relative to those past climates. And while we aren't at Cretaceous temperatures yet, carbon dioxide levels are at their highest since ice cores began 800,000 years ago at 400 parts per million and our temperatures will soon follow.